Why, Stephen? Why? Why? Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to True Crime Loser. How you doing? Good to be back. Hope you're doing well. This is the sixth and final installment of my Stephen McDaniels commentary. Man, it's been a slog. We are deep in the troll vortex of insanity. I don't think anyone's gone this far. It's like cave diving, but a lot more dangerous. It's funny, there's a lot, or well, not a lot, but there's definitely uh, some people that are coming in and watching these videos out of order and just being like, why is he calling him Stiven? It's really annoying, okay? I could only watch five seconds of this video because I don't know if he's trying to do a southern accent, but he's just calling him Stiven. <laughs> I love that these videos are just going to be on YouTube just going into the future and there's going to be people that are like, why does he call him Stiven? <laughs> um, all right, so let's just get into this. I think we're picking up about 40 minutes in to this and at an hour 37, they leave him in the room and just leave him in there like a little troll, just sitting there motionless. And we pick up as Red Shirt is in there. And Red Shirt is just trying to do everything he can to battle the vortex. And at one point, he goes, Staven. We're real people. And I think that line right there, the Staven, we're real people. If you, you could boil this whole interrogation down to just that one line to describe what the troll vortex of insanity is. That line, we're real people, would be crazy in any other interrogation. They're not talking about evidence. They're not talking about the murder He's trying to convince Stephen that he's real. That's how far it's devolved. We're real people, Stephen. Stephen. And then he's like, Dude, it's going nowhere. Stephen really settles in and does pretty well on this last push. He almost gets stronger with time. It's crazy. He really gets this, the yes, no, I don't know going hard. And it doesn't look like he's feeling the pressure and red shirts like do you use acid he's trying to figure out why he's just sitting there you use acid and then he and then he goes with the i know you're not a monster technique which we've seen i think in every interrogation that i've analyzed it's a common technique of i know you're not a monster Staven, Staven, I know you're not a monster. You don't want everyone to think you're a monster. It's kind of a legacy strategy. It's saying, do you want your legacy to be that you are just this cold, troll-headed freak? Or do you want your legacy to be something got out of hand, you made a horrific mistake? And they were using that against Chris Watts and old underwear Russ. Just, you're not a monster. I know you're not a monster. Let's get this out. Let's just get this out, Stephen. And um, what I thought, what it sort of seemed like Red Shirt was doing when he started going into the legacy strategy of, I don't think you're a monster, are you? Is I thought he was just going to, kind of abandon trying to talk to Steven and just sort of talk at him. And it's a strategy, or I don't even know if it's a strategy, but it's a, it's a, it's used just to kind of abandon the interrogation and just talk at him. It's, you'll see it with people that it's obvious they're not going to crack. So one that comes to mind is the Jim Smith, Michael, uh, what's it called? 
Rafferty, I think, Michael Rafferty, Jim Smith. Look that one up. And if it's not Michael Rafferty, someone in the comments will know the real name. But these interrogators go after this Michael Rafferty guy for a long time. Jim Smith has taken turns, and it's just obviously Michael Rafferty is such a piece of shit that he just doesn't care. You know, all this, none of the strategies work. They're saying, they're doing what they did with Russ where they're saying if you want if you don't want your loved ones to have their houses turned upside down with searching you got to tell us you know Michael Rafferty's just sitting there you can tell he's not going to crack so at one point Jim Smith instead of just keeping kind of the insanity vortex going Jim Smith changes gears and just goes listen I don't care if you talk I'm just going to talk at you you know we know you killed this person. You're going to spend the rest of your life in little rooms like this. You know, it's like if you can't get him to confess, you might as well just lay it down, lay it on the line how it is. Like you, we know you killed him. You're going to jail forever. I don't even care if you talk right now. I'm just going to sit here and talk at you. It's over, buddy. And... I thought that that's what Red Shirt was going to... It sounded like the tone of voice he was using is he was going to do this in this interrogation. And that's what I would have done. I would have said, Stiven, I don't even care if you talk or say, I don't know, you can just sit there like a little troll. But you did this. You killed that girl. And you're going down. And you're going to spend the rest of your... There's not going to be any... You're not going to be a lawyer. All that work you did was for nothing. It's over, you know, and just see him react to that because you could really kind of just drive it home. I thought that's what they were doing. I was like, finally, just do it. And um, and, and he brought back into the vortex to strap in. Um, all right. White shirt comes back in. And I think white shirt, I think he's just a little bit tired this night and he seems a lot more susceptible to just fall deep into the vortex even than red shirt so he comes in to take his turn and he's talking about Steven's family saying do you love your nieces and nephews and Steve goes yes and it's like well if something happened to them would you be sad and Steve's like yes and this whole time, Red Shirt is just standing. It was just staying right up in Stephen's face. I even think still holding his shoulder. So as Stephen is looking at White Shirt, Red Shirt's face is just right here. And that goes on for a little bit, and then Red Shirt just leaves the room. Um, we find out that Stephen is living off student loans, and he's. I don't think he's ever really worked or had a job. Um. And they ask him what his plans are after he graduates. And his plans are in two weeks from, you know, where they are in the interrogation, two weeks he's going to move home with his parents, which I think really support what I said, where he just freaked out at the thought of not being just a college kid without a job, living on student loans, gets to sit on his computer all day, you know, probably has to put a couple hours into studying, but just sits on his computer all day. He's got his little prepper fantasy with the toilet paper rolls. Gets to indulge in his violent porn. You know, the girl that he's stalking and infatuated with happens to live right next to him, so he kind of can just perv out to that thought. And I think he really kind of likes his life. He gets to live just the, I sit on my computer all day. Once he moves home, I mean, maybe his parents are bizarre too. I've seen a couple comments that say that his parents are just the sort of the same troll vibe as he is. But once you go and live with your parents, they're going to be like, we don't need all these SpaghettiOs, Stave. And the toilet paper rolls too. Can we put those in the garage? Why are they in here? Um, so white shirts just get, get, it's going nowhere. He's asking him questions. A lot of just, I don't know. And at one point, white shirt goes, do you know anything? 
and Steven just sits there, just trolls right through. Um, and then this just shows how susceptible that white shirt is to the vortex. This is the the difference between the troll vortex versus reality. So white shirt is trying to get the information of when was the last time Steven cleaned his car, right? And so in a nor in a lot of interrogations it would be like when was the last time you cleaned your car? And then the the person would be like, "Well, I haven't cleaned it since I got it back from my mom. She borrowed it when her car was in a wreck." But with Steven it goes when was the last time you cleaned your car? I haven't since I got it back. Who'd you get it back from? From my mom. When did your mom drive it? She got into a wreck. You went down and picked her up? No, she got in a wreck in Maycomb. So she got in a wreck in Maycomb. Why was she up in Maycomb? To see you? She was getting the brakes checked. She was getting the brakes checked in Maycomb? She was getting, there's a good brake place in Macon. Sorry, Macon. Was I calling it Macon? <laughs> and then, I mean, it's just like all this time goes by, and then all of a sudden, all he's found out is that his mom drove his car for a few days while hers got fixed. And it's just like, all the time, White Shirt is still continuing to test the limits of the office chair. All right, and then White Shirt, after the whole, like, mom car drove brakes in Macon, nothingness, White Shirt goes, lift up that shirt. Let me see those scratches. And I, watching it, I was like, yes, let's talk about the scratches. That is the best evidence so far that they have. And Steven lifts up his shirt and shows him the scratches, and he doesn't, he just goes, oh, all right. He doesn't stick on it. He spends five minutes talking about how his mom got her car fixed in Macon. And he doesn't press him on the scratches. I just don't get that. All right, then hour 17, Red Shirt comes back in. And while he was gone, apparently he talked to a bunch of people that Stephen had worked with. Stephen had worked with. Um, at the clerk's office and asked him like what Steven's personality was during that whole internship or that he worked with them and everybody had said oh he's so nice he's got a you know a person he's got a bunch of personality and he's always socializing so he comes back in white shirt leaves the chair is very happy sigh of relief from the chair and um it's like, you were so nice to everyone at the clerk's office. Why just the yes, no, I don't know? And Steven just goes, I don't know. And Red Heart Shirt's <laughs> head falls. I really like how Red Shirt doesn't try to hide his frustration. Like, most interrogators wouldn't want the person to see that they're so frustrated that they're slamming their head on the table or just going, why, Steven? Also, in the back half of this... Red shirt's cracking me up because he'll he starts saying Steven's name as if it's just offensive when he lies. So he'll be like, Steven, did you hurt that girl? And Steven will be like, No, I didn't do it. And Red Shirt will be like, Steven! Steven! Like he's just offended that he's lying. I don't know. I end up really kind of being fond for Red Shirt as this goes. Steven! Someone that finds this video in four years is getting really mad that I'm calling him Steven. It's all right. Hang in there, buddy. Um, all right. So an hour and 22, Red Shirt really just turns up the pressure for the final push. And it's the funny, like, when was the last time you did laundry? And Steven's like, not for weeks. <laughs> And uh, Red Shirt's like, you got enough underwear to go three weeks? And Steven's like, yes. 
And he's like, you wear underwear more than one day? Yes. Why? And Stephen's like, because it's still clean enough to wear. It's diving. Little T, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen. Little T. So people were saying that she gets a drink out of my water. This is actually her water. We bought her a $150 like cat fountain that has a waterfall and that and she won't drink out of it. The only place she'll drink in the whole apartment is out of this cup up on the desk. So I'm sitting on the piano bench, so we have to put the piano bench right here and she jumps up. That's why she jumps up on the desk is cuz I'm sitting in her seat and she drinks right there. So, a little tea everybody. Little T is 11. She's a tuxedo cat. She's cool. All right. So the final push. <laughs> um, let's see. You get enough underwear somewhere in deep in the Canadian jail system. Russell Williams is thinking about underwear and going... Why, Jim Smith? Why? <laughs> um, okay, so to this point, there's not. Re I don't think they have any evidence, which is just such an uphill battle for interrogation. Someone had a comment that it's like really whether an interrogator looks like a genius or just looks like they're not very good, comes down to the evidence they have behind them. And I agree with that. If you have all this evidence and stuff, it's probably easy to go in there and confident and be like, Russ, what are we going to do, Russ? But I don't think these guys have anything, which is just weird because at this point in the interrogation, they've been searching Steven's apartment for hours. And you would think they would have found something, but, but they have the scratches. They're not bringing those up. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever quite understand how this one played out. Um, all right. So after all this time, Red Shirt is doing the final pressure push, gets up right in his face, and we are there. After all this buildup, we are finally at the hair is there, Stephen. Steven. And he's going, your hair fell out, Steven. When you were moving the body. And he keeps, he keeps taking a pad and scratching his hair and going, look, Steven. Look how easy your hair falls out. Look, Steven. Steven. He's like, look at all that hair up there. You don't think any fell out? It did, Steven. Your hair is there. Your hair is there, Steven. You don't think... He goes, you don't think none fell out? It did. Just right in his face. Your hair is there. And then he kind of gets somber and he's just like, why, man? What happened? And I feel like he should have stayed on that. I think that he should have just started talking at him like, what happened? Why did you do it? Why are you sitting there like a troll? Just say it. Um, and with, with no evidence, it's st they still kind of know what happens because Red Shirt basically stands up and says, Staven, you went into her apartment and you hurt her. And uh, Stephen doesn't crack. He's just sitting there motionless, hasn't moved in hours defies human defies human nature and then finally red shirt just goes well you sit here and leaves the room and for the rest of the recording that we have steven doesn't move and then apparently and this is just where it gets just confusing so apparently in the tape that we don't see after steven has not even budged for two hours just put her in four-wheel troll low and just trolled right through every single strategy. Just with mud tires. 
apparently sometime later in a in the footage that we don't see, which is just sketchy, they get Stephen to admit that he has bur- gone into other apartments, burglarized other apartments for one condom. I don't know how they got Stephen to admit that. Um, it just seems weird to me that he would, but that's enough to arrest him on the burglary charges. And then... 20 days later, or no, yeah, 20 days after they, they, so they're holding him for the burglary charges. 20 days after that, in a search, they find the keys and the underwear. Underwear? Russ? And, and then like two weeks after that, they charge him with murder. And then for two years, they offer him plea deals, which to me says he, doesn't want to go to trial and for two years he turns down all those plea deals and I think he really uses his uh, knowledge of the law to kind of not get pushed around by the plea deal so for two years he doesn't take these plea deals and they don't want to go to trial that to me says the state has very little evidence and it's a little weird that there's no DNA evidence. Um, and then two years later, the FBI or somebody is able to pull, finally pull off some footage that he had on a camera that he had deleted, was finally able to pull off the deleted footage of him inside Lauren's apartment the night of the murder so we had gone in there before she had gotten home and just like recorded the door and recorded like what her bedroom was like kind of just planning and then once they finally had that piece of evidence they presented that to him then he took the plea deal and part of the plea deal is he had to write an allocution which I had never heard before until this and so part of the plea deal was like Here's the plea deal. You get this, this, and this. I assume it's they took the death penalty off the table. But in return, you have to write a detailed allocution, which is just a detailed confession of exactly what happened so we don't have to barrel into the future not knowing. And I love that. I wish they would do that. I, why not do that for Chris? Why not always do that? If you're going to do a plea deal and take the death penalty off the table, it's like, tell us what happened. We need to know. And so if you Google Stephen McDaniel allocution, it's like one single spaced page. And I'm not going to read it, but it just says how he went in at 4 a.m. and strangled her and then was kind of in just like a delusional state afterwards where he didn't really sleep. And he sort of, and I don't know if I believe it, but he he said he didn't even really know if he even killed her. Like when he was helping her friends search, he was just in this such a bizarre, weird state. And that he doesn't know why he did it. It's I think he said it's beyond his reach to figure out why, but he just thinks it's something with his, the way he's wired. And he says that he's very sorry and he wishes he would have taken it back and Blah, blah, blah. I think we got a true just weirdo troll on our hands. And I am very excited to be done with him. So I think that's about it with Stiven McDaniel. What a guy. What a vortex. But we did it, people. What a slog. I love you all. I am very glad I am done with this man. Uh, Thanks for everyone that took the whole ride with me. Stephanie Lazarus is next. Definitely not tomorrow. I need a few days to start that, but I don't know. I'll figure something out. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks for everyone that subscribes and participated. True Crime Loser, out. Why, Stephen?